Absolutely love it, sir. That's fantastic. <laughs> love a fellow friends. collector. We can be friends. You have a bunch of omnibuses. <laughs> I've got a bunch of those. Even that, see that X-Men box behind your head there? Yeah, I've got yeah. that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> New mutants are dangerous. That's why you're here. This past Sunday was actually the three-year anniversary of me being at the Medfield uh, State Hospital where I got to I, visit. That I was just thinking I got a thing on my phone the other day that was like three years ago and I was on set and I was like, <laughs> okay, that's how long it's been. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the, the movie that you described back then, I was so, I'm so excited for it. It yeah. has me so excited. And I'm curious just how much the movie has changed since then. Well, I mean, it really hasn't changed much at all because we never were able to go do any reshoots or any sort of pickups or anything like that. So the story never changed. Uh, we had about a year plus of limbo where the Fox Disney merger was happening, where literally nothing happened with the movie at all. The visual effects, the work on that was stopped. So they never, I never saw finished visual effects until this past year. And it's, it's why you see more of that stuff in the trailers now and not earlier because you were seeing just stuff with practical effects for the most part. So I, I don't know. I mean, it's been a long process, but for me, it was a happy ending because once the merger was done, Disney really came back and let us go finish the movie without anybody bothering us, really. So it was sort of great. And we're really getting to release uh, what we went and shot and set out to make, which is uh, a strange, it's a strange brew, but I think it's a really cool brew that hasn't been done before. And I think it's, you know, one of the very few superhero movies that doesn't just feature an adult cast. It really is made for teenagers, about teenagers. And the way John Hughes movies were that you don't really get in movie theaters nowadays. So we sure. sort of uh, tried to smuggle that stuff into a superhero movie to try to get away with it, I guess is, is my way of saying it. Same with like the gay love story in it and things like that. You're not alone, not anymore. You mentioned the cast of characters and I'm just so excited to see this group of characters who I've known from the comics for years and years mm -hmm. to see them finally in live action. And actually just, I want to kind of talk about them one by one. There you go. Beautiful. Sinkovich. Love it. <laughs> and uh, I mean, and you mentioned the word limbo. So I'm going to use that as a perfect transition into talking about magic. It's magic. So am I. This is a character who has a fairly complex origin story and footage that we've seen of her, I mean, she seems to be pretty trained with the soul sword. She's obviously uh, teleporting everywhere. Uh, I'm curious just kind of how much the movie is going to be diving into her origin story and what fans can expect. You're not going to see like the demon Belasco and it's like, you know, I'd say like every, all the mythology from the comic book has been honored but not the stuff that's a really difficult to explain without a lot of crazy X-Men backstory. Like for example, Lockheed came from outer space and he belonged to Kitty Pride first. Then he eventually was sort of adopted by Ileana in the New Mutants comics. And it's like, we simplified that in ways just to make it more grounded like the movie and less connected to that sort of stuff. But you still get Lockheed, I guess what I mean. And in a very similar way that you do in the comic, but we've tied him much more into her powers and into Limbo. So I'd say everything's about Limbo is the same, except it's now tied so psychologically into her backstory and has less to do with a demon named Belasco that nobody's gonna really connect with or understand and is sure. gonna clash so much with the tone of the movie, you know? So it's more just- and you don't want like a 20 minute segment where you're just going off on a tangent, yeah. It's why Magma would never be in one of our movies because it's like, there's a Roman empire in the Amazon somewhere. It's just not gonna translate well to the kind of grounded, character-driven movie that we're making. It's important we find out your power so we can help you get better. To move from there to Wolfsbane, uh, mm -hmm. obviously cinema history is filled with so many awesome werewolf transformations. This is an interesting character in that she's not really a werewolf because she does the mm -hmm. full transformation into a full wolf yeah, and yeah, yeah. also has that kind of middle version. And I'm just kind of yeah. hoping you can talk about your philosophy about the transformation process for her. Doing any sort of transformation costs a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get to do as much as I probably wanted to with it, being a big fan of like an American werewolf in London and all that. Uh, Silver Bullets, one of my favorite Stephen King movies. I fucking I will swear by Silver Bullet. I don't care what anybody it. says. Uh, <laughs> it's so good. So I'm a big werewolf fan. So it's like, we're not, it's not quite werewolf, but it's like we used, you know, a real wolf. Like when she's a wolf in it, she's a real wolf. Uh, nice. Went and got a wolf uh, that was Maisie's wolf double. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've got pictures of them together. They got along quite well. Uh, nice. and, you know, there's a bit of an in-between state and all that. But, you know, for, for me, what was more interesting about her character was really the character's sort of oppressive religious upbringing, which felt personally, allowed me to get personally invested because I was raised by 
you know, evangelical Christians in the Bible Belt in the 1980s. Uh, so some of my childhood was a little dark and scary in that respect, but like uh, it gives you something to butt your head against uh, you to get through life. <laughs> we can get out of this together. So, so is it kind of a painful experience for her when she's like, just because she's almost kind of rejecting it just because, because of her background? Yeah, I mean, she clings to it as well in a great way where it's like, it's funny, everything in this movie is painful for everybody because everybody's there because they're a killer, you know, to either voluntarily or involuntarily with Ileana being the most voluntary of them, who really was the most justified in doing what she did. I killed 18 men, one by one. And the others are accidents that happened or terror, just terrible things that happened. I just lost control. I started panicking. My girlfriend had a burn hair. So I guess it's about trauma and about PTSD in that way. That sort of courses through it and through all the characters and Danny's powers manifesting or what sort of forced the characters in a one flew over the cuckoo's nest, girl interrupted kind of way to work through their problems. And then okay. they ultimately well, I mean, have to save Danny from herself, you know? Sure. What's the last thing you remember, Danny? The trailers, you have that great, like, Freddy-esque effect where he's basically coming in through the yeah. wall. Uh, I'm curious just how much of an, how much ultimately was there a reference uh, for you from Nightmare on Elm Street when approaching that character? I mean, a lot. I mean, it's like, that's a sort of certainly a foundational horror movie that Nate, my co-writer, and I watched in the 1980s when we were kids and were so scared that we had to rush to his house and watch Better Off Dead just to nice. clean our to cleanse our palate before we went to bed. Mercy buckets. But Nightmare on Elm Street 3, for sure, that's what gave us the location to put these characters in to make it different from other X-Men movies so that we could actually make a new Mutants movie. Trying to find a way to put it in one place and make it budget conscious enough that uh, we could get it made was sort of the key, you know? So when we had that framework to put the story in, everything started to come together. And actually you do have one character who has appeared in another movie, which is Sunspot, had yeah. a very, very brief uh, part in Days of Future Past with that. Very Adam brief. A, was that kind of nice for you not to have to like, just because his role was that small, but also like, was he at all a reference just as far as like, especially when he's in his like solar charged mode? I mean, no, we really did our own thing with it. I really wanted more of the balls that Bill Sinkovitz drew around around him when he's moving. So a lot of them are moving fast now. We tried to get more of that stuff in just cause it's like that stuff looks closer to the comic, I think. Mm -hmm. But you know, we were lucky. We just knew we really wanted to cast a real Brazilian. We wanted to cast a real native American. Uh, we wanted people who were deeply connected to those places and those tribes and could actually uh, help bring authenticity to it. So like we probably looked at 300 people for Blue, people trying out on reservations across the country in Canada uh, and saw so many Brazilians. I can't even tell you, uh, you know, people argue about lighter skinned or darker skinned Roberto. And it's like, I saw the very best actor I saw was Henry Zaga and he was Brazilian and that was more than good enough for me. He also uh, personified so many of the character traits that I wanted that character to have that I felt from the series, you know? That was so hot. And uh, lastly, there's uh, Cannonball, which I mean, that's a power that I feel like if you make a mistake, it could kind of come across as goofy. Exactly. And we just actually earlier today um, saw like the first footage of him uh, bouncing around. And I'm just kind of hoping that you could talk about the process of uh, just building that effect. We just wanted him to be somebody who punished himself and we wanted him to be somebody that uh, couldn't quite land, had broken his arm, had broken a bunch of bones in his body, isn't quite good with his powers. If he's flying up without a chain on him, there's a chance he'll die. You know, we just wanted it to be sort of uh, actually scary the way powers are and like carry or fire starter. I guess when I say my Stephen King reference, I really mean in regards to how he treats what are called superhero powers in comic books. You know, th those are the things that, uh, to me, would be much more horrific and much more paralyzing and terror, you know, terrifying than it would be cool. So we wanted sure. him to just be somebody who was an embodiment of the sin he'd committed in the past, accidentally, but still, you know. You've been through a lot. Get some rest. <laughs>